Hi, welcome back to Kids Corner. You know, I love being outdoors. It's one of my favorite things, going out with the family and riding four-wheelers and just spending time out in the woods. Uh, we even like to go fishing. Now, at a young age, and even now, I'm an impatient fisherman. I cast out there, start reeling. I can't let that bobber sit. Start reeling it in, nothing. Cast it out there, start reeling it in, nothing. Now I'm skipping rocks. I'm that kind of person because I get bored with it. And I love skipping rocks because the object is to get the that rock to go right across the top of the water. How many times can you get it to hop? And it's embarrassing because I get out there with my kids sometimes, and I'll tell Drew and Nate, I'll go, watch this. And I'll rear back, and I throw a rock, and I don't get the right angle, and it goes clunk right in. Sinks to the bottom. Because guess what? That's what rocks are supposed to do, sink to the bottom. They're not designed to go across the top of a lake. Uh, if we put the right trajectory on it, if we get it just right on the spin, if we get the right speed and angle, it can skip across there, but eventually it sinks because that's what it's supposed to do. As human beings, we're not supposed to be able to walk on water. We're supposed to get in there and we can swim and hold ourselves up, but guess what? If you stop paddling, bloop, down we go. That's the object behind it. But I want to tell you a story about when ma a man was able to walk on water. I love this story, and we're going to talk about Peter. Now, leading up to this story right here this, in the Bible, we're going to be in uh, Matthew chapter 14. You can go ahead and get your Bibles and get ready for that. Leading up to this, Jesus has just fed the 5,000, the multitude. Everybody was fed, and there's more than enough food. And now he sent his men out, go out on the sea, go ahead of me. And the waters are starting to get a little bit you know, ruckus, and they're starting to shake them around, and they're getting a little scared, and they see Jesus walking towards them, but they're scared. They're like, is this a ghost? And that's where I want to pick up right now. So again, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 14, starting down here in verse 27. They see Jesus, and they're scared. They fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, is that you out there? Hey, tell me to come on out there. I want to come out on the water. I'm not just jumping in and swimming to you. I want to come out on the water like you're doing. So he, being Jesus, said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? The thing about this story is that Jesus told him to come and he had to have faith. Peter wanted to walk on water, but eventually he just started to sink. Because that's what he's designed to do. We're not supposed to be walking on water. Just like this bowling ball here, going down to the bottom. But with Jesus, with the faith that with faith in Jesus, Peter was able to walk on water. See, the whole point of this story is faith. And keeping our eyes on there. I want to show you something, just so you don't think that this was not real. These are real bowling balls. Just like Jesus, he was real too. Jesus came here to save us. But what happened was Peter took his eyes off of Jesus. See, things started happening around him, and he's walking on water. He stepped out of the boat, and he's like, I'm walking on water. Woo, look at me. It doesn't say that in there. That's my idea of what it was happening. He's walking, but then he looks around. The waves are still crashing, and he's like, whoa, I, I'm walking on water. What am I doing here? I'm supposed to be sinking. And he took his eyes off, and he saw everything that's going on around him. We do that all the time. We forget to concentrate on Jesus, and we start looking at everything that's going on. I'm out of school. Everything's not going right. We can't go to the movies. We look at everything bad, and we forget, hey, concentrate on Jesus. Keep your focus on Jesus, and everything's going to be okay. That is our concentration. Don't let fear step in. Keep the faith and keep your eyes on Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, today should be the day that you make that decision. Because he loves you. He helped Peter walk on water. He showed him with faith in him, we can accomplish anything. So, 
Do you know Jesus? If you don't know him, I want to pray today, and I hope that today is the day you make the decision. So you have that concentration, that focus on him, because he's, he's, he's pulling on you. He's calling you in. He's saying, come to me, just like he told Peter. Peter said, if it's you, command me to come out. All Jesus said was, come. Won't you come today? Won't you come to Jesus? Lord, thank you so much for an opportunity to share your word with these people out here on, on their TVs and their, their phones, their uh, computers. I know it's not ideal situation for us. It was a distance, just like Peter seeing you in a distance. But all you're saying is, come to me. You fill the, you fill the gap. You, you take that void out. Lord, if there's any that don't know you, maybe today is the day that they make that decision to follow you, Lord. Follow you anywhere, even walking on water. We thank you so much for blessing us, giving us opportunities to reach kids, and thank you for giving us a country that we can live in that gives us the freedom to worship you. In your name pray, amen. I appreciate you being here, and I'll see you again. You're the one who rescues me And you rescue
count on one thing the same God who never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the way the same God who's never late is working all things out is working all things out oh yes I In the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Yeah. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy on my days. Oh, yes, I will. Count on one thing The same God who never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out Is working all things out Preparation or response, I guess, and uh, really no announcements as, as far as announcements go, uh, but I am anxious to hear the governor's announcement on May 4th as to when we can come back into this room together. Uh, six weeks, it's, it's a long time, and I can't wait to see you all. I hope everything's well. I uh, hope you're enjoying your time with your family. But again, this will be over soon. See the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, maybe life will get back to a normal that we all love. Or maybe get back to the best things of normal. And maybe we've learned some things that we don't need to bring back into uh, what would we all would consider normal. So this morning, I will be in Psalms chapter 46 and verse 10. Now, this is a very familiar passage. As a matter of fact, I, my first Sunday in the series, 
I preached on this, and I wanted to bring it back in as an introduction to a complimentary passage in Proverbs. So I'm not preaching on this. We're just tying it together because one might hear the, the passage in Psalms and say, well, stop your fighting, stop your warring, be still. But then what is it that we do with the energies? How is it that we focus, you know, in an effort to find a calm in all of this chaos? Okay, so I know we're not supposed to be fighting and doing all this, but what do I do with myself? And so that's what we're going to kind of compliment this morning. I want to thank everyone for the support, uh, for their attention over the last few weeks. Uh, but man, I can't wait to see you. Um, windshield worship has been going great. Thank you for those who come up. It's just good to see you. Uh, but I'm ready for the bubble life to be over. And uh, just to see you here in the pews and the chairs will just be a special day. And I'm, I'm so excited just to hear our voices together, uh, to, to hear the talking, the greeting. Uh, but we're, hey, just weeks away. So here we go in Psalms chapter 45, 46 and verse 10. It says, stop your fighting. And again, I preached on this just the other week. Most of your Bibles will say, be still and know that I am God, exalted among the nations, exalted in all of the earth. So we have that, but then I want to follow it with, again, a very familiar passage. And over the last six weeks, I've tried to really bring back passages that we're all familiar with and maybe breathe some, some depth and life and application into them. And most of you have probably memorized this passage as well, Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. And I want to include verse eight, 7 and 8 in this because it's so particular to the situation that we're going through. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, know Him, and He will make your path straight. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. This will be healing for your body and strengthening for your bones. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the opportunity we have to come together in some form or fashion. Lord, for so long we've made much of the facilities of a church when in just mere moments they were taken away. I pray that as we anticipate our re physical reunion together here, that it will not be a celebration of being in the church, but rather a celebration of being in the presence of our brothers and sisters together before you. Lord, and I pray that we do have a new appreciation and a new understanding of our relationship with you. That it's not about necessarily a role we play in a building or an entity, but it's our relationship with you that's a priority. Now, Lord, when we'll come back together, there'll be a new appreciation for the processes, for the priorities. That we're not here for any of our own agenda, but we're here to worship the one true and living God together with one voice, one heart, in unity under the banner of the cross of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you'll take these things and you'll use them for your glory. Because your word promises where your name is lifted up, not my name, not anyone else's name here. Your name is lifted up. You will draw men, women, boys, and girls to yourself. And Lord, our community is waiting on this church. And I pray they wait no longer. It is in the name of the Most High, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, so real quick, I want to take a look at both of these passages. So Psalms 46, 10, 10 and I, I normally use Christian standard, Holman Christian standard. Stop fighting and know. So again, some of this is just a rehash. Stop fighting. Stop fighting what? Well, I think that you'll see over the course of the next few moments is stop fighting him. Stop going, stop going along with your own agenda, your own expectations, your own understanding, your own assessments, your own interpretations. Folks, I don't understand why, how, all this jazz, but what I've got to do is step back and stop, stop fighting all of that. Stop buying into the fear. Stop buying into the anxiety. Stop buying in to the idea that I have some form, some fashion of control in any of the situation. Because when I believe those things, when I buy into those things, 
which there's no such thing as control, then it leads me down a road of frustration, despair, anxiety, and depression. And we talked about all this five, six weeks ago. So I have, this is not a, you may read this and think, well, this is telling me not to do anything. And no, it's actually telling you the opposite of that. It's telling you to stop what you're doing and start doing what he's asked you to do. Start doing the things that he's called you to do. Start understanding his sovereignty, his lordship, his power, his provisions for you, his protection over you. Instead of getting caught up in your role in all of this, your place in all of this, your priority in all of this, he's to stop fighting is just surrender. Stop getting, stop choosing to put yourself in a situation where you will never win. There's several reasons why you're never going to win. The Lord's not going to give you control over everything. Now, Scripture does say that if you want to go into sin in your own life, well, hey, at some point, he's going to say, okay, go get it. But is that really what you want? Stop fighting and no. No means to recognize with everything I am. It also means to know intimately that there's nothing about it I'm not aware of. There's no facet I haven't taken time to step around and evaluate, to assess, and to respond to with direct application in my life. Stop fighting and know what? That he is God. He makes the rules, right? Again, all this are just a review. He makes the rules. He's the one that sits on the throne. I am his, his servant. I am his slave, as Paul says. Now, some of these words none of us are going to like. But folks, it's just scripture. When you ask the Lord to save you, when you ask him to make you his child, to adopt you, friend, there was an, there was an agreement there. There was a covenant. Do we have the Old Covenant and the New Covenant? The Old Testament, the New Testament. And a covenant is an agreement between two parties that say, hey, I'm going to do this, you're going to do this, and then we're going to come together, and here's the arrangements. And friends, you made an agreement. When you gave him your life, your eternity, you gave him your fellowship, your servitude, your love, your devotion, your faith. Friend, and you, we fight that. We fight for control over our lives. I've got to know that he is God, and I know, and we're going to show how you know that in just a few moments. That he is going to be exalted among the nations, and he will be exalted. The earth. These things are already set in course. That all of his creation will go through the consequences, the turmoil of sin because of man's choice to sin, for sin. And so there's going to be a day that all of this, all of creation is resurrected, is, is re restored by the Son and his return and, and friend. It's going to happen. You can't stop it. So if I know something is going to happen, that th this thing that is going to happen is, is good, is great, is glorious, is in my best interest, allows me to experience all of God's goodness, friend. You have a choice. Instead of choosing, going in every direction you want to go, other than where you know you're going to be, inevitably, you can live like hell, friend, and he's still king. You can live like you want to live, and he's still going to be glorified. Scripture said that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. That's all of them. Yours, mine, those who don't attend church, those atheists, all of them. That's all of them. So we all know where we're going to be, but we try to go in other directions and find ourselves in other places when, friend, if I know that this is what Scripture has promised, and friend, it's true, it, it, it's always been true, then why don't I just go there? Stop fighting. Stop trying to go and achieve something you're never going to achieve. You're never going to win God's place for glory. That's reserved for Him alone. He's, you're never going to go to that place where you control, predict, and even dictate an outcome. He cannot share kingship, nor can he share glory. So, now, stop fighting. What does stop fighting look like? What is it that I've got to do to find myself aligning with what I know, with where I know everything is going? How is it that I get in line 
with the Lord. That instead of my efforts being for my own agenda, that they are directly in line with his will and his glory. Well, that's where we go to Proverbs chapter 3, 5 through 8. So we recognize now that we've battled, we've warred for control, for freedoms that we surrendered when we gave the Lord our life. Now, when you say, well, I have a will, well, okay. A slave has a will, but a slave also has a choice. A servant has a will, but a servant also has a choice. And so there's friend, friend there's days that my will doesn't necessarily align with his, and neither does yours, let's just be honest. But I still have a choice. I can recognize that Lord, I feel like you're leading me in this way, but that's really not what I want to go. I really want to go this way. And so there's a choice. So, yes, while the Lord may have given you a free will, you're still responsible for that will. And we, we're really bad at accepting the responsibility for our own decisions because a decision is a choice. And we, we also get back into, well, I have the right to make a choice. You don't have the right to make a wrong choice. You have the ability to make a wrong choice. And so how is it, again, that I find myself making decisions and doing things that align with his will, his glory, so that I am not fighting anymore, that I'm not this anxious, de depressed, frustrated purposeless being that I wake up every morning and I align, I evaluate, I make choices that are in the best interest of my spiritual life, the spiritual life of my marriage, my family, my business, the church, whatever that is. How is it that I take the fighting out of life, the warring, the raging, how do, I, how do I take the bumps? You know, most of our Christian lives, we've heard it compared to a roller coaster. Man, we're doing great, and then, oh, man, not so good. It says here in a second, you'll make our path straight. Now, normally, we think of them as curves and straight rather than heels or consistent. If you're going to make my path straight, that's what I want a consistency in my life. I really like the highs, but the lows... Those days where I'm battling, I'm warring, and I'm frustrated or I'm disappointed because what I want didn't happen, instead of stepping back and saying, hey, God's sovereign, everything that happens happens for a reason, for my good and his glory, do you understand? There should be no low as a believer if I understand and respond to his sovereignty. So let's, l listen to this passage and see, see where the believer is supposed to make a choice to be. And I hear people say, well, where I'm, wherever I'm at is where the Lord wanted, wanted me. Do you really think that's true? Because you have a, a free will. You have a choice. So there's God's will. There's your will. And it is a choice you make for those wills to align to his divine purpose. You say, well, I've, you know, I've gotten involved in drugs or an affair or, or whatever the case is. And I'm just, I'm where the Lord you know, I'm here, so this must be where the Lord wanted me to be. No! No, you chose to be there, but God can still bring good and glory from it. Don't blame your bad decisions on the Lord's will. That's not what His will is for. Now, there are times the Lord allows us to go through hardship, frustration, despair, and pain to teach us more about His love. But the Lord will never lead you to choose anything inconsistent with his standard. The Lord's will will never contradict his word. So don't, don't go there. So let's look at it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust. Now, friend, if you have trouble trusting the Lord, it's hard to trust anyone you don't know. 
It's hard to trust anyone that you've not seen their actions be consistent with their words. So the first issue with most of us in the fighting thing, so to stop fighting, to, to be still, to find calm in the chaos of a fallen world, in bondage to sin, my first step in, to stop fighting and to find calm is to trust. To make a choice to give someone and to trust, to hope, to recognize that God wants the best for me. Now, I do not worship him because necessarily he wants the best for me. I worship him because he's God. And being God, he loves me. Being God, he created me. Being God, he restored me. Being God, he can achieve, desire, and fulfill the best for me. So again, my worship is not just because he does good things for me, but because he's God. That's why I worship. That's why we choose to worship. But in, the, in response to his, his Godhead, in the fact that he is God, he must be trustworthy. So for me to stop fighting, I've got to step back and respond to the fact that he, by nature, definition by attribute, is trustworthy. Now, I can, I can assess that based upon truth, or I can assess that based upon a personal relationship with him, that he's never done anything inconsistent with his word throughout history, as long as history has been recorded. Everything that he has prophesied has been fulfilled. He has continued to take care of me, answer my prayers, and give me his peaceful presence the times that I've needed it the most. And that's, that's where the beautiful part is. I can respond to an intellectual knowledge of his deity or an intimate knowledge of his person. But either way, he is trustworthy. So for me to stop waging war, trying to understand, being frustrated, looking for purpose, trying to dictate the quality of my life based upon my will, which is egocentric, selfish, to the, to the core, friend, I've got to choose to trust. And that trust allows me to then build something that my attempt to control never would. I can't try to control and manage and, and be afraid and anxious and, and worried and micromanage my life <coughs> and at the same time trust him to take care of me. So for my life to calm down, it begins with me stepping back from that driver's seat that, that has that drive, and that driver's seat is all the pressures and all the weights and all the worries. And before long, I'm just so weighted down and weary that I just can't stay asleep at the wheel anymore. And in all that weariness and all that weight, I find myself steering in directions, right? That I know is not the best. But because all of this pressure is on, because I chose to drive, all this pressure is on, I just, I'm not seeing things clearly anymore. I'm not processing. I'm not, I don't have the peace that allows me to process from the heavenlies. I'm processing in the driver's seat. So trust is when we say, Lord, you are trustworthy. I'm really worried about this, but I just can't handle the worry anymore. It's destroying me. The fear, I'm just tired. I'm tired of being afraid. You know, I, I, friend, I can't wait to just go to Walmart and not worry about anything. Can't wait to go to Dollar General. Can't wait to go and eat and hear people. And just hear the, the chaos of life. While I've enjoyed the simplicity, there is a beauty in humanity and the excitement of togetherness. And there's so much, I, I don't think the Lord wanted to hurt anyone. But he did allow this to happen. 
And he's taught, I hope he's taught us so much and so much that we remember for a very, very long time. So trust the Lord with all your heart. You can't half trust someone. You can't love someone with half your heart. You know, you can't love them this day and not this day. So if I trust in the Lord, that trust requires everything or I don't really trust him. I use him. You see, when I trust someone, I give them everything because I trust their ability to value it. But if I just give them this, this, and this, no, that's a usury. That's when we as Christians get so good as in, Lord, I'm going to give you my hurts and my hang-ups, my ha- I'm going to give you the bad stuff, the stuff that I really, that's really not that valuable. I'm going to give you those things that I don't think I, I can really control, but there are things that I can control. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to maintain the ownership and the stewardship, uh, the management of these things like money relationships, marriages, purity. Lord, I'm, I'm going to trust you to like take care of us like so that you always give us food like you do the birds. But as far as the purity of what I look on my phone, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep that. Lord, I'm going to trust you with this. But as far as my marriage goes, I'm not going to work on my marriage. I just really don't trust you or I really don't want to do what you want to do. So I'm going to not trust you with that because I know what you, because you're God and you, you know everything and you govern everything, then, then I know you're sovereign. And so I know if I, I do what you've promised will bring blessing, but Lord, still I just don't want to. I'd rather my life be in turmoil over following my own will than I had just surrendering to yours and finding the peace and the promise that is throughout Scripture. It's not even logical, friends. Not even logical. Trust in the Lord with all. For you to stop fighting and finding the calm, it has to be everything. Because what happens? You've heard, you've seen the, the chip commercial. You can't just have one. Friend, surrender is complete. Trust is complete. Trust is your, your whole heart. So as long as I've got something, because control is addicting, as long as there's some part of my life that I reserve, that I hide, that I have this false idea that I'm in control of, then I'll always relapse to control everything. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. For in salvation, you said, I give you my heart. I give you my fellowship, my devotion, my faith. I believe. Well, friend, believing has consequences. Good and, and, and un, unfortunately for the, the arrogant control individual, negative. I've got to give it all. Faith, you can't believe something halfway. You can't trust something halfway. Most of us are choosing to try to do that, and so our efforts and the blessings are only half of what God has in store. But God's ability to move in our community, in our marriage, in our family is limited. Because, friend, He can't honor a half-hearted, half-approach. Trust the Lord with all your heart. And do not rely on your own understanding. Well, what I think, friend, if, you, if, if what you're going to do in life is based on what you think, let that be like the biggest red flag anybody's ever waved right in your face. Because here's that, I know this is what the Lord wants to do, but I think, eh, stop, boop, 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 don't. Do not respond to circumstance emotionally. You can't trust yourself. Scripture says the heart is deceitfully wicked. Friend, trust the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely. Do not make decisions simply based on what you assess or interpret from the situation. Because, right, like, here's here's the whole of timeline. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago. 
And this, this represents as many thousand years as the Lord wills in all of eternity. Right? This is like never ending. So I need to get rid of this, but I don't know how. So we're just going to put a little dot right there that represents where we are. And God above, sitting on his throne, I'm just going to draw a cloud, right? Because I, I don't want to personify him and it not be a good picture and I can't draw or write. So there's heaven, right? We'll put a cross there. All right, there's heaven, and here's all the timeline, and all I can see is this little spot right here. But heaven, the Lord on his throne, sees everything. And so can I really think that in my own selfish, egocentric nature, that I can make correct, righteous, glorious decisions without consulting his understanding? You see? We pull ourselves from everything we know to be the truth. We convince ourselves to be a lie because it achieves our will. And remember, we've got his will and our will. And we all say, well, we just want the Lord's will. But do we really? Or does that just really sound good? Because most of the decisions we make are not God's will. Well, I know um, this wouldn't be God's will for me. But. Friend, come on. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own understanding. I don't understand anything. There, there's nothing. I do not process eternity past and eternity future at the same time I'm assessing my own little finite, minute life. I don't understand anything. And the best way to stop fighting, to be still, and to trust Him is to say, I don't have a clue. Man, I just, I just wing it. Every day I get up and my prayer is, Lord, I have no clue. And, and just listen to this. I have no clue what's going to happen today. I'm at an absolute loss. I don't know how to prepare that I would pray that I would prepare. I don't know how to really get my ducks in a row. I don't know what's going to happen to the office. I don't know what's going to happen to the family. So I don't even know what frame of mind to put myself in to really handle anything all the battles that await, because I do know there's battles, I just don't know what they're going to be. So, Lord, you do. Right? Lord, you know what today has for me. So you prepare my... I can't, I can't pre prepare my heart. I don't understand what's going to happen. I don't have the foresight, the foreknowledge. And so, friend, to trust Him, I've got to realize... How finite and honestly insignificant I am. We make a lot of ourselves. But there's one day you're not going to be here. I'm not going to be here and the world is going to keep spinning around. They'll remember us for a bit. But then that's it. Now heaven will be a glorious place. But friend, understanding, the only understanding I have in this life that is beneficial, I find right here. Do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, all your ways, now we get into We've kind of been in a mindset. Now we get into the response, the effort, the action part of it. In all your ways, know him. Again, that, that agnosco in, means to know intimately, to respond to, to recognize, to hide nothing from. In all your ways, know him. Other of your versions will say acknowledge him. Everything you, should, everything you do, everyone should assess and observe, interpret as you're someone that loves the Lord, someone that has trust in the Lord, so that my decisions are God-honoring, my decisions are consistent with His standard and His, his laws. And all your ways know Him, also know Him, means, hey, I've consulted Him about this, and I've assured, I'm assured that this action aligns with His will, that I have prayed, and I know this is what I wanted to do, and I know this is what the Lord wanted me to do, and I, I have made a choice to surrender to that. 
Let's keep going. And he will make your path straight. Why is it that the spiritual life is up and down? Well, sometimes we're faithful and sometimes we're not. Sometimes, man, we trust him and it works out. Sometimes we think we trust him, but when things don't go well, we blame it on him. We get disappointed. Our faith has a, a hit, a crash, and our faith struggles a little bit. No, friend, trust is even when I'm in the valley, God's got a plan and I'm not going to stay here. So my mindset, my faith level should be consistent because he's still God. Keep going. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Scripture says choosing to become wise, they become fools. Again, you can justify anything you can fathom doing. Any sin you have a desire, you can justify, right? Right? You you all you know your processes. It begins with thought. Like remember, everybody's been on a diet, right? And while you know you shouldn't, you sit around and you think about that food until eventually you've justified that you deserve it. Friend, you never deserve the sin. You've never earned the right because you've surrendered that to him. And and I speak for me too. There's no one of us as believers that can ever get to a place. Now, this, this is intellectual. This is relational. Anytime I find myself in a place where I'm trying to justify or prove to myself that I deserve a, to sin, that's, it's insane. So, again, wisdom. If I'm trying to justify, I'm going through a process of choosing to become wise in my own eyes. But in the eyes of the Lord, I'm a fool. Because if I trust His decision, His will is in my absolute best interest, anything else is stupid. It's foolish for me to say, Lord, I know this is best, but whoo, I've been really trusting you. I've been, man, I've been at church, I've been praying, I've been witnessing, but man... I want to look at this. I want to do this. I want to take this. I want to go to this place. I want to be with this person. I've been so faithful that I deserve to go sin. Friend, no. That's not wisdom. That's stupidity. But we interpret it as wisdom because we really like to glorify our assessments of sin. In your own eyes. You can't trust these things any more than you can trust this thing. The heart is deeply wicked, the knees are the windows, right? Friend, it doesn't matter how you see it. Again, you can be upset at somebody, you can justify just tearing their rear end up. In your eyes, they had it coming, right? But what does everyone else see? What does he see? This is the standard. It's not just the filter. This is the standard. Your eyes are not. So no, in your eyes, don't trust your assessments. They will always be for your best. That's where the choice comes in. I know me. I've, I've lived with me for 40 years. I know me. I know that I, I make decisions for me. So when I ever have that inkling, that idea, that I begin that process of justification for my will, I've got to pull myself back and say, no, I don't trust you, Eric. I trust the Lord and his will. Keep going. So don't be wise in your own eyes, but rather, so this is the opposite of being wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord. Oh, I'm not going to get in real far with the fear of the Lord thing, but I've heard so many people say and just really take the power out of this statement. And, well, they say, well, I believe fear is just a healthy respect. That, you know, I mean, it's like he's God and like he created me and he loves me, so I just think I need to respect that. No. When it says fear the Lord, 
it says, it's not about my assessment of his deity. His deity is. God can do what God desires to do. He creates. He, he gives. He takes away. That's his right. He's destroyed nations. Friend, fear the Lord? Yes. I do respect the Lord, but at the same time, he's got the power that brings great caution to me as a created being. I am here because he chose to put me here, just as he can choose, if, if he wills, that I have no longer value or purpose here. And I don't want that, neither do you. Well, God wouldn't do that. Well, he can. I'm not saying he would, I'm just saying he can. And that power is a power I don't have. It's a power I can't control. So fear? Yes. I'm not going to mess with the Lord. And if you're, listen, if you're wise enough in your own eyes to put God in a little box as to what he can and cannot do, friend, that's humanism. God has all the power. And when I surrender to Him, that power can align for His cause in and through me. But I don't have any power as to pull myself apart from Him, assess Him, and contain Him. See, we, we've, got, we've made the Lord weak and us powerful. No. I have nothing over him. All I have in him is his love. Friend, I love him because he first loved me. Now, you, you can go on with your respect, and you need to respect the Lord. But friend, that fear means so much more than a healthy respect. It's also an awareness of power, an awareness of authority. Let's keep going. So fear the Lord and turn away from evil. So in response of God's goodness, which I, I also respect, fear his goodness, because I don't want to be against God's people. I don't want to be against the nation of Israel, and I don't want to be against one of my brothers and sisters in Christ, because I fear his protection over his people and turn away from evil. So, friend, I don't want to be caught in evil because I don't want the Lord against me. The last person, the last thing, the last individual, the last entity you want against you is the Lord. Don't mess with him. Why is your life just almost a constant taunt to his glory, right? Constantly doing things we know we should not be doing. Robbing the church of her power, the bride of her beauty. There's no fear of the Lord. Because we don't turn away from evil. Now it says, if you do these things right here, because we wanted to be still, we wanted to stop warring, we wanted to get rid of this purposelessness, this anxiety, this chaos that has become our lives, then if you will do these things, then God will bring, this will be healing for your body and strengthening for your bones. Friend, it's never one thing ailing our country, our generations, control, anxiety, depression, confusion, frustration, because we rely on our own understanding. We choose to become wise and we become fools. We have no fear of the Lord. We turn to evil. And so there has been great harm to our bodies, our minds, our understanding, our function, our marriages, our families. So how do we be still? Well, let me give you these few things and we'll be done. Number one, surrender to his love. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. For me to be still, for you to be still, I've got to stop fighting. 
Why am I fighting a God over control of my life that loves me so much? He loves me so much, He created me even though I would hurt Him. Everything about His love for me has been sacrificial. And now what does that tell me? That I can trust Him. Because, again, in your life, what you're looking for is someone's actions aligning with their claim. And He says He loves me. He tells me He loves me. But then everything he's done is evidence of that love. So I know I can trust him. So that enables me to stop fighting and to rest and to just know I don't have to look out for me anymore because the great creator is looking out for me. Well, how do I know that? Well, because he loves me. Because he gave evidence of that. Next. Surrender to his lordship. Lordship is not a word, a term that uh, we like much anymore. But it means for me to rest, for me to stop fighting, for me to find calm in the chaos. I've got to trust him. I've got to surrender to his love, but I've also got to surrender to his lordship. I've got to put myself in a place under his authority, his provision, and his protection. Because if I don't make that choice... My will is, again, constantly warring with his. So I've got to know that I am warring. I am fighting. I've got to stop that fighting. And I'm, I can stop that fighting because I can trust him. If I can't trust, listen, if I can't trust God, I've got to fight him. Because i got to take care of me. You see, I don't have to fight him. He's proven that love and that provision for me. So I can surrender to his love. And in his love, I can surrender to his lordship. Say, Lord, I recognize that you want the best for me. So your commands align for the best possible life for me and my family to be the most blessed. And so your lordship is not something I'm going to fight anymore because I understand you love me. And in that love, I can trust you and I can surrender to a lordship, yes, that, it, that I am a servant of the Most High, but I am also a child of the King, a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. And so it becomes easy again when I stop looking at things through my understanding and respond to his revelation. Next, surrender to his leadership. So we've got his love and his lordship that I've got to surrender to. But I've also got to give him the leadership of my life. See, lordship is when I say, okay, I recognize where you're at. I recognize your position and your power, your, your omniscience, your omnipotence. You're all knowing. I, I, I recognize those things. That's the lordship. But then I've got the leadership, how that comes into my life in all of my ways. Not only am I going to recognize that you're the Lord, but I'm going to allow you in that position to lead me in every area of my life. Lordship is position, and leadership more or less the practice. That, Lord, all right, I'm, I'm about to make a decision, and I, I need you to lead me. You are Lord. I need your leadership. Show me what your will is and friend if you will ever and your your advice to someone your advice to yourself ever begins with i know this but there is no here it is the craziest thing most of us well there's none of them he's hidden his will from it's not the knowledge of his will it's the surrender it's the response in all your ways know him and he will make your path straight Lord wherever you lead I'll follow you show me the path I'll go down four surrender to his laws surrender to his love lordship his leadership and his laws we don't like laws um, some make much of the Ten Commandments. 
So I'm very opposed. Uh, the Ten Commandments are valuable. They're part of God's Word. But that, that is not the standard by which the new covenant is built on. The standard was the blood, the grace, the mercy, the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. So again, the surrender to his laws is don't be wise in my own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. God's word should govern our lives. Plain and simple. And it all it says, if we do these things, that there'll be a restoration, a rejuvenation, a revival in our body. You know how tired you feel sometimes? How wore out, anxious you feel? Stop fighting. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't rely on your own understanding. In all your ways and everything you do, know him. And he will make your path straight. And he will bring a restoration to your body. He will repower, re-strengthen your bones. Because there is only calm when you trust the Lord with the chaos. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the opportunity that we have to, again, be together in some form of media. Lord, I do pray and yearn for that glorious day when we reunite. Lord, I pray that you tend to the families and the marriages of our people. Lord, I pray that we come back together. We are more powerful because we have spent time in the presence of the Almighty on our own and we bring great praise to the assembly Lord Jesus I just ask that you make much of yourself Lord use us to achieve that Lord forgive us when we've leaned to our own understanding when we've not feared you Lord forgive us restore us, rejuvenate us it is in the name of the lover of our soul the lion of Judah, Jesus Christ Thank you, folks. Have a wonderful afternoon. Cannot wait to see you. If you know if somebody needs anything, please, please give the church a call. Have a great day.